So uh, we're, we're in this series, and I'm looking forward to continuing. I wish there was a way, if, if I could figure out how to do every weekend the way we did last weekend, I would, because that was awesome, so much fun, and thanks for your feedback there. But we just want to, there's a couple more steps uh, that I want to take in this series. And the first one, well, one way to launch in is, so when I was in my early 20s, actually I think I was 20, and I started hanging out, like I wasn't raised in church culture environment, and so in my late teens, early 20s, I started hanging out in this college and career group thing, which is actually where I met Teresa, and I, I'd been to house gar- gatherings, but never the ones like this. And one of the things that they would do to introduce people, I don't know if it's still the thing, but they would always play this like two truths and a lie game. And that's how you introduce yourself to people. And as an introvert, like that was my version of hell. I just wanted to sit in the corner. So I just developed a script and it was what I used at, at all of them, whether people had already heard it or not. And my, my, my two truths and a lie in no particular order were uh, one time I met Mr. T., One time I played a catch with Ozzy Smith, and one time I spent a Saturday in in Warm Springs. (laughs) Pretty good one, huh? (laughs) So the first one's actually true. I was in St. Louis as a kid. We were walking the streets right in front of the TV station, and out of this car stepped Mr. T, to which Hannah this morning's like, who is that? (laughs) (laughs) We have a picture of the guy, yeah. So, which I was thinking, too, it says something about our culture, because 20 years ago, 30, 30, 40 years ago? My goodness. Like, he was a beast, right? He was huge. And by today's standards of weightlifting and nutrition and all that, he's really not that big. But I did actually shake his hand, and he wasn't all that large. And I did actually spend a Saturday in in, in Warm Springs. There was this time, it was around this time of year, uh, my uncle, who lives in Seattle, had bought a Taurus wagon from his brother-in-law. It was a lesson never to buy vehicles from family because he flew back to Billings to buy this Taurus and he was driving it back to Seattle. He had little kids and around Butte we started, and so I decided to ride with him because my mom lived in Missoula so he was going to deposit me <coughs> in Missoula because she was going to help me buy collared shirts and clothes because I was at the time going to go to a Bible school in Portland that I'm really glad I didn't end up going to which is not a comment on them, it's on me. But anyway, the, in, around Butte, the car started having problems. Uh, by Warm Springs, the car quit, and we were able to kind of limp it off the interstate right at the exit, right at Warm Springs. And I checked it out this fall when we went biking in Anaconda. There's, at the time, it's still there, there was this bar. Like, the only thing there off that exit was this cinder block building bar. It was the only thing that sat there. It's still there today, but it's not open. And so it was cold like this, the roads were bad, This was pre-cell phones and iPhones and Wi-Fi and all that stuff, so we walked over, it was probably like a quarter mile or so, over to this bar in the freezing cold, and of course we had to find a pay phone, but we had to get change, and then we we walked into this bar, and it must have been, I bet it was like 9 or 10 in the morning when we first got to this bar, and there was one lady working, and there was one guy sitting behind the bar who did not bother to greet us. Let's just say that. He he looked like somebody who probably had the night shift, probably had a really hard job, blue-collar type job, probably long hair, long beard, and he was hunkered over the bar at 10 a.m. or whatever it was. So that tells you a little bit about the, the context. And so we would stay just long enough to where it felt like we're warm enough to go back out there. And, you know, he, as, especially as men, you just have to open the hood and pretend like you know what you're doing. You know, like we just open the hood and stand around and stare. And we were waiting for my grandpa to come get us from Billings. And we go back to the bar when we were freezing. And finally, it was 11 o'clock. And I think this might have been the first year after Elway had retired. But I knew in my head that the Bronco game had started. And so it was in this very uncomfortable environment. I, that, and there was this one TV behind the bar. I said, hey, the, the Bronco game's on. Can we watch that? And the, <laughs> the guy turned and just eyeball to eyeball and looked right at me and he said, F the Broncos. <laughs> and that was the end of it. <laughs> Condemnation is kind of what I want to talk about. I thought that'd be funnier. You guys didn't think that was very funny, but I, I was scared to death. You know, there's this device that I all too often use as a parent. Uh, there's this device that I all too easily use as a spouse or a friend or a leader or even in my own head. I can use it when I watch politics on TV. I, I can use it all the time. And this morning, I, I think I, think I want to talk more about parenting and relationship and friendship than I do politics, but I do think it applies there as well. But really, I think it starts by asking this question of how, how do we hold intention the fact that like, I'm right, I'm entitled to an opinion uh, with the fact that so are you, so are they, so is she, so is he. And that doesn't even necessarily mean that both of our opinions are equally, like, accurate, 
But it does seem like when, when, what happens in life in particular, and especially what's happening in the political sphere, but I think what happens in parenting when there's age difference or in marriage or in, in leadership is there's this reality of I, I, want, I want to claim my God-given right for influence, but I don't want you to claim yours. And there's a tension that, that comes about from all that. And, it, and it's made all the worse if you're someone who's trying to allow the, the narrative of Scripture to, to frame your life. Because from the very beginning of this story, that there's some things that are both convenient and inconvenient that, that happen. And the first one is that God gives God's power away. I mean, it's like, almost at, at times it feels willy-nilly. Uh, you, you could construe it as irresponsible, but this God is constantly, instantly, it seems, giving of God's power to others, giving this, this ability for influence. I was actually listening to a podcast this week, and I need to re-listen to it to make sure I heard it correctly, because it's uh, someone who I have great respect for, and they were talking about COVID-19 and this whole pandemic, and they come from a more urban spot in Europe, and, and he, he actually went so far as to say that if you're being cavalier about COVID, and as a result, cause your 85-year-old grandma to get COVID and she dies, that, that's akin to, to manslaughter. And, you know, it's those weird things when you hear someone you really respect and you don't necessarily know if you agree, and I, I guess I don't, I don't know what my final view on that is, other than to say, the extent to that's true, then God is guilty of manslaughter every second, because God is constantly giving power away. And that doesn't mean that there doesn't have to be boundaries, and that's why we have laws, and there's all these kinds of things, guardrails that we have to do. But I do think interpersonally, in marriage, in parenting, in being parented, in being the boss, and being the employee, and being on the team, and being the coach, it creates this tension between, like, what, what do we do the, with the fact that you're made, you're made for influence, and so are they? And so how do we claim our God-given right without stepping all over the other person who's claiming theirs? And, and I think part of what makes this tricky is it's, it's different with a 2-year-old than it is a 12-year-old, than it is a 16-year-old, than it is a 26-year-old. And how do we navigate this? And so what I want to do this morning is there, there's a particular spot in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says some things. And if, if you've been around church for a while, if you haven't, it's great to see you. But if you have, you've probably heard these verses that we're going to look at this morning a, a zillion times in your life. Uh, Dallas Willard does something unique with them that I had never heard before him, and that is he takes them all consecutively and, and, and therefore says Jesus is working on one thought. And what I want to do is, is therefore uh, ask this question of how do we do this? Here's another way to frame this question. Of D Dallas says this. I got two Willard quotes this morning, and then I'll leave you alone with Willard. But here for me is the epitome of the tension. He says this, God has paid an awful price to arrange for human self-determination. He obviously places great value on it. It is, after all, the only way he can get the kind of personal beings he desires for his eternal purposes. And I guess this one is a kind of current political comment. I just talked with a friend this week who lost two friends of 20 years because he, he chose to take a, a he, he just took a political stand on a particular issue. And I'm not even necessarily saying he's right or he's wrong, but, but he actually shared in one instance with me the, the, the exchange that he had with a friend of 20 years who he had just recently had dinner with who said, our friendship's over. And I think Jesus' word for that would be, uh, or statement towards that would be, that's called control via condemnation. And there's other ways. So here's this chunk from, from Matthew 7, and this, this may be one of those moments where, where Sunday is more about being reminded than learning something new, but for me it's been really helpful in this season. Jesus says this, Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you'll be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And here's where I just want to keep going. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if your child asks for fish, will give a snake? 
If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. What if what Jesus is getting at here is uh, this, this way of managing the tension, but by, not by way of condemnation and not by way of unwanted advice, but by simple just exchange of ideas. See, that, that first chunk is probably among the most famous things Jesus has ever said, and I, I don't feel the need to, to recover a lot of the ground that's been covered. Obviously, Jesus demonstrates his incredible knack for understanding the human condition because part of what he's exposing in the judge stuff is that like, what I'm most annoyed by is probably the thing I hate about myself. Like The thing that I'm most annoyed by in you is, is probably most true of my own crapola. That the thing that, that I most judge in you, and this can get scary sometimes, I think sometimes we've got to listen to ourselves when we come out really strong against something, that, that, that may be a reflection of something God's pointing out in ourselves. And that, that is obviously what, what he's getting at. Tony Campolo, for me, still captured this better than anybody else when he says, at the very least, what Jesus is saying is when, when you're calling out somebody else for their sin, it better be with a tear in your eye, not a smile on your face, or else you're really not ready to do that. But, but the issue is, okay, so how, what, what, what exactly is happening here? Well, Willard would say that, that what's happening here is, is condemnation. That, that what Jesus is really getting at here, that the nuance of the word judge, and you can do the original Greek stuff, and he does it in the book. If you don't have a copy, let me know. We, I can make you some copies. But that what Jesus is really getting at here is there's this human propensity to... to to, to do influence, to, to make change, to confront behavior via condemnation. And I think part of what makes it really tricky, uh, and I think we just have to name the struggle of this one, is at times it seems like Jesus does that very thing. There's this extraordinarily famous event in the life of Jesus. It's unclear exactly where it happened chronologically in his life, but there was this time where he, he strolled into the temple turned a rope into a whip and started throwing stuff around and like beating people with this rope. He, he made some declarations. That, uh, he, he quoted from, from his Bible, the Tanakh, and said, my, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And there, there's some historical context there. We, we know now that, that the temple aristocracy was taking advantage of lower class Jewish people because they would, they would raise this lamb for sacrifice at the temple and then they would walk the long journey to the temple, days long journey to the temple, and then they would get to the temple and they would be told, sorry, that lamb's got this flaw in its right earlobe and so you, you can't offer it. But like an airport, they would say, but conveniently, we can sell you a hamburger. The problem is it's $20. And so there was this, uh, I guess, extortion, I suppose. There's lots of things you could call it. That's probably part of what Jesus is calling out. We also know that the, this market that had been set up was set up in the court of the Gentiles, which speaks to the heart of the God who said even to Pharaoh, like, hey, I want you to know who I am. The plagues had as much to do with God's desire to know Egyptians as it did Jewish people, and the court of the Gentiles seems to speak to this very same heart of God who, who left a place for people outside of Jewish tradition to come experience the holy. Uh, that there's some suggestion that there's even things happening uh, around at this point in Jesus' life. The temple had become a haven for, the, for those who would lead the resurrection. And this is why in Luke's version, Jesus stands outside uh, the city and weeps and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you knew what would bring you peace. There's some evidence that it would become kind of a safe house for people who would lead a rebellion and one that Jesus knew was going to get them crushed. And so that leads to this theological thing ca called righteous indignation. And it's a reminder that anger is not always wrong. But here's what Willard says about that. And I, I, don't, I don't really know what to do with righteous indignation. I know as an Enneagram one, I don't trust myself with anger very much. I'm rarely able to, to find that moment where it's justified. The, the other thing before we go there, sorry, is I, I also have to remind myself frequently that like Jesus went to the temple at the first time as an eight-day-old eight, eight infant. It seems that he was back. Maybe it wasn't his first time back, but at 12. His family seems to be in the type of family who probably went to the temple at least once a year. That, that would have been kind of the low bar for a serious Jewish family. 
Jesus died, we think, at 33. Again, we don't know when he cleared the temple. In, in the gospel accounts of his life, he visited the temple more than one time, which means that Jesus had stood and watched the heinous, condemnable behavior for, for years and had seen it, I, I, and by my count, a, 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 a conservative estimate 20 times before he did what he did. And, and here, here's... Here's something Willard says that really challenges me. He says, we must be aware of believing that it is okay for us to condemn as long as we're condemning the right things. It's not so simple as all that. I can trust Jesus to go into the temple and drive out those who are profiting from religion, beating them with a rope. I cannot trust myself to do so. What if part of the invitation of Jesus is to go, don't do control via condemnation? Okay, so then what happens next? Well, then he starts talking about pigs and, and dogs and holy things and pearls. And I think the best way to get to the answer of all this is like, or an answer is by way of questions. Because historically, the church has at times said that this is a suggestion of there's worthy things and unworthy things or valuable things and unvaluable things. I, I, take, uh, I have a problem with that just because Jesus' fundamental thing was that everyone has value. So what is a swine, and, and what does a swine need? Or, or you could ask this question, can, can, a, can a swine make any use of a pearl? Do, do, swines, do, do swines, do pigs, like do they go to prom? Do they dress up for Friday night? Do they wear jewelry? No, what, what does a pig need? They, they need sustenance. And on that level, does a pearl uh, provide sustenance to a pig? Well, well, no. And yet, is a pearl valuable? Taken in and of itself, does a pearl have value? Maybe not to you or I, doesn't to me, but especially in the first century world before they figured out how they could manipulate the manufacturing of pearls, they were of incredible value. What if the tension here is really about giving something, something giving a pearl something that is valuable but that the pig doesn't want? What if this is about control via unwanted advice? Ever experienced that? I know I'm on the giving end of it all the time. See, what, what if what Jesus is setting up here is a larger contextual story that's actually not fundamentally about prayer or even fundamentally about judgment per se, but it's about how we do relationship. And he starts by saying, don't do relationship by way of condemnation, which every parent in the room is like, ugh. It's the hardest thing, especially when we just are out of our like, controlled center and we just lash out. We, Part of the reason why we, we can so easily beg on condemnation is we've all experienced it. It cuts to a level, level deeper than just being told that we're wrong because we're told we are wrong. And at the surface, unwanted advice is way, way better. But is it? Ever just needed to talk about something that hurt on a deep level and you didn't find a listening ear, you found a book or some unwanted advice. I know I do this all the time, and, and I also know how refreshing it is when somebody doesn't do this. And behind it is what? It's, it's I think, a heart that's afraid. I wonder even if fundamentally what we're seeing with, by way of the political ads is, is tied to these two principles. What are the two common themes? Condemnation. Nobody's saying like, well, this, this gal's a great woman, but her policies on this issue are something you should know about. It's, it's almost all by way of condemnation. And when it's not, I mean, just the, the, the sheer volume of it of what? It's just, I mean, it, it seems like on some level, all the ads and, and all the flyers are the definition of unwanted advice. So what's the alternative? See, this is the, the beautiful part, I think, of Willard's take. Ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. A knock and the door will be opened. Which many of us, have we've had our struggles with prayer on this issue because it feels like this blank check that oftentimes we write the check and then it doesn't work and we wonder, like, why do we even pray? But it would seem that, that Jesus isn't fundamentally even talking or primarily talking about prayer. He's talking about what? Relationship. Just a way of relationship that when you have something, you just say it. When you need something, you just ask for it, but you do so without any internal need to control the other. 
Uh, I can go back a little over a year's time and there was a friend of mine who we don't get to spend a lot of time together, but he'd asked me for a meeting and it was a context where I knew that this meeting wasn't necessarily going to be all roses. And when we sat down, I can still picture it in my office and we had a good conversation and there was a point where he said, Adam, I do have something to share that, that's just honest. And he said, sometimes I, I think sometimes you underestimate the power of your words. Does that make that person more or less safe? Or, or let me put it this way. Had I heard that he was saying that to somebody else but never to me, does that make him more or less safe? Remember, Jesus isn't talking about how do we get to heaven when we die. He's talking about how do we live in it now. God's kingdom come now. What if he's portraying a way of relationship that says catch yourself in that impulse to control others by condemning them? It's a very familiar trick in our culture, and it's in some ways refreshing to me to go, it's as, it's as old as the human experience. And even catch yourself by way of unwanted advice. And yet, that doesn't mean there's not permission to, to at times share. Ask and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be answered. Just, just say what you need. I was walking this week, I think it was on Friday actually, with a friend who's in a leadership role, and in that kind of lower end of discouraged, and, and I, was, I was trying to ask him, it was at the end of the meeting, I was trying to practice what I was preaching, I was trying not to give him advice, and then there was this point where just the overwhelming thing in my head was, I, I, so I just finally asked him, I said, hey, do you ever find yourself in a room and you just instantly know that you're not the smartest one in the room? And he's like, yeah, sh- sh- sure, on some level. And I said, do do, do you ever find yourself in a room and you know you're not the smartest person in the room, but whoever those smartest people are or that smartest person is, they also, they're not giving you advice. Uh, They're not condemning you. Like, you know they're smarter than you. You know they have input that's better than yours. You know they're a better parent, they're a better person, they're a better character, they're better at following God, and yet you just have this sense that they're with you. And I instantly went back, and I think it was in my mind because... I, the day before, I had a phone conversation with my friend Brian Hopkins, who helped start this place. He led a church in Bozeman. Now he's in Sacramento doing Hopkins scale things. But I do remember this decisive moment in Portland when he said, uh, Adam, because he was technically my church plant coach, he said, my job is to give you a steel spine. And I, as I was talking to this friend, I was, I was realizing that like, one of the things I'm grateful for, and I have lots of them in my life, are these, these people who, many of you, who, who do give me a steel spine. And hopefully, you, this isn't all about me. But the definition of that for me is what? It's these people who, on some level, you know they're more wise and more objective. And by definition, they're less emotional because they don't live your life. You, you know they've got insights that, that would solve all your problems, so to speak. You know there's stuff about you that they see that's fundamentally broken and they could call out. Then you know that there's books they're reading and advice they could give you. And yet part of what makes them so safe is that that's, that's just really not the culture of the relationship. And yet that also doesn't mean that they're yes people. There's times where they do say stuff. I don't know if all that connects, but for me it was this end of Friday to go in, I think this is everything Jesus is talking about. Figure out how to be the type of person in relationship who resists the urge to control via condemnation, who resists the urge to control via unsolicited advice, but who also has the type of relationship that when you want something, you can ask for it. When you see something, you can name it. And it's this reminder that what we said at the beginning of this series is there are political nuances that I'm not qualified to speak to, and I know at times there's this sense of like, I thought we were doing politics in this series, and you're not really touching politics. Frankly, I'm not qualified for that. I, almost everybody in this room knows more about the nuances of politics than I ever really even want to know. Part of it's the design of the way I want to lead. But it does seem like Jesus is constantly offering this third way. And it's this way of going, what happens if we use this season to pay attention to the way we use condemnation? What happens if we use this season to pay attention to the way that we give unsolicited advice? And what happens if we use this season to be reminded that those those relationships that are just for you, not because they think you're perfect, not because they think that, that, that there's 
no problems in your life. They're just for you. And therefore, they have all the credibility in the world to point something out when it needs to be said. You know, I think this morning for me is this reminder that the victory of the cross it, it led to the victory of the resurrection. And more than heaven when we die, that was day one of a whole new order, a whole new creation that Jesus surprised everybody by going, it's not entirely starting now, but it's starting now. His kingdom come, his will be done. And the hard work of that would be inviting him to transform the way we do interpersonal relationship now in a way that will be relevant in his future kingdom later. I'd like to pray. God, Lord, I'm, I'm thinking of spouses and parents and friends and bosses and coworkers and managers and kids, friends, coaches, teammates, classmates. Lord, it seems like this topic in particular is the epitome of the two wrongs make a right and it's it's really easy to fall into it when we become victim, a victim of it. And so we would just ask God for a, a, a clarity of consciousness and, and heart and mind that, that this would be just, just a little Holy Spirit reminder this morning that, that, that there's a different way that we can do relationship and that it involves playing the long game. And Lord, for friends here this morning that they don't, they don't even know what they believe about you or... God or Jesus, um, God, my, my hope and prayer for them would be that, that there would be this, this alternative way that, that they would understand is available to them because of who you are. We love you, God. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.